All right, we're going to finish up chapter 10. We're going to start on chapter 11. I opened up Sapling for chapter 10 and I made it due on Monday rather than the weekend because the last 10 problems are synthesis problems where you are given a reactant and a product and you have to come up with ways to synthesize it. And it's, they're very difficult, so I want you to be able to have a chance to get some help on those if you need it. So the due date's on Monday. Uh, we're now going to hit uh, several chapters that are fast chapters. Chapter 11 is a fast chapter. Chapter 12 is a fast chapter. Chapter 15 is a fast chapter. Chapter 17 is a fast chapter. So we have a sapling for every chapter. This is the point in the quarter where you're going to get behind. So please make sure you are up to date um, on after this weekend. We're also starting to accumulate a bunch of reagents and we will continue doing that for the rest of the quarter. So um, we're going to talk about cataloging reactions after we finish chapter 10. All right, let's finish up chapter 10. So last time we were talking about hydroboration and what we saw was that it is a syn addition and it's anti-Merkonikov. When we do the oxidation, it is 100% retention of configuration. I told you that you don't need to know the medicine, the medic. <laughs> I'm having a hard Friday here. Uh, you don't need to know the mechanism for oxidation. Um, you can come in, if you're curious about it, come in and ask me in my office hours. I already had somebody that uh, asked me this morning, um, but I can certainly show you, but it's not something that you need to memorize for any of my exams. So 100% retention to configuration. So what that means is that where the boron is, the boron and the hydrogen came on syn. Bulky boride on, bulky boron on the, le on the less substituted side, the hydrogen on the most substituted side. And then when we oxidize it, we put it a hydroxyl exactly where the boron is. So that's what I mean by retention of configuration. So it goes exactly there. And um, that's the overall reaction. I want to talk about regio selectivity next. So uh, we know that the bulky boron goes on the least substituted side. The hydrogen goes on the most substituted side. And so if we have something where we have a completely different substitution on each side of the alkene, so right like this for example, the carbon on the left has two methyls, the carbon on the right has one methyl. And if we have that, we get what we call good regio selectivity. So here's the incoming groups. Again, a hydrogen on most substituted side. Why is this hydrogen on most substituted side? Because this is an anti-Markonikov reaction, so it's opposite of HBr. So it should be going on the opposite side that you would expect. Hydrogen on most substituted side. And bulky boron. That'll help you to remember it. Bulky boron on least substituted side. What kind of numbers do we get? Uh, let's see, we get 98%. And then we get two, only 2% 2 of the opposite regioisomer. So definitely good selectivity. On the test, I will ask you for the major product, and it's very clear that the first one, the anti-Marconikov product, is the major product. What if we have something that's approximately symmetrically disubstituted? What I mean by is that is that both sides are not identical, but each side of the alkene has one R group. So um, that would be this one right here. Let's scroll down a little bit here. So each side of the, each alkene has one R group. But this R group's a little bit more bulky, but it's still just one R group. So what kind of selectivity do we get if we use BH3? So um, both sides mono substituted. <laughs> but this one happens to be a little bit more bulky. 
do we get good regio selectivity under those conditions? And it turns out, and let me just circle the incoming groups here. Not really showing stereochemistry on this one because we're focusing on regio chemistry here, 57%. <coughs> where the bulky boron is on the less bulky side, I would say, I would say and 43% here. So I would call this poor selectivity. And so one of the things that you can do to help the selectivity immensely is to bulk up the boron. If you bulk up the boron, then it's even more bulky and it's going to be even more likely to go on the less bulky side. Okay, so let me see what the reagent that we're going to talk about using is called 9-BBN. And um, there's a simplified symbol in case we want to draw this because that's a little bit difficult to draw. A simplified symbol for this is kind of like just having kind of a hammock or a sling hanging from the boron just to make it a little easier to draw. This would be the simplified symbol. For 9 BBN. All right, so advantages of using 9-BBN. Reasonably stable, B2H6 reacts violently with air and is a gas. Um, so this is a little bit more stable to work with and the bulkiness gives it high selectivity. Um, also notice um, stoichiometry, BH3, when we usually use BH3THF, we, um, we have three hydrides, so we use, a three, we use a three, um, equivalents of the alkene and one equivalent of the BH3. This only has one hydride, so we use a one-to-one -one ratio here. Okay, so a little bit different stoichiometry if you're actually doing this in the lab. And so let's look at that same example we did on the previous page and see what kind of selectivity, selectivity we get with 9-BBN. So um, here we're going to, I'm just going to draw this right here. Same idea. I will use the simplified version of the 9-BBN. So the arrow comes from the pi bond to the boron and then the, the second arrow comes from the boron hydrogen bond because remember the hydrogen is transferred as a hydride with its pair of electrons. And then what you get, so here's our bulky boron here. We'll just draw it as a sling here. Here's our bulkier boron. And the selectivity goes from, what was it, 57%, 99.8% versus um, 0.2. So this is great selectivity now. So it's a much better reagent. It's more stable, it's less likely to react with air, and it gives you much better selectivity. All right, let's talk about stereoselectivity and hydroboration reactions. And so let's um, talk about, we'll do 9-BBN again. So let me draw this out here. Arrow comes from the pi bond to the boron, and then the second arrow comes from the boron hydrogen bond. And I'm going to just draw this alkene. I'm going to wedge the front so this front wedge would be heading, t would be, it would be perpendicular to your page. And we have this, we have the hydrogen here, and we have hydrogen here. On the top there, that's uh, methyl, we'll just write ME there. And we have our boron. We're going to get plus enantiomer, right, because everything we're working with is achiral here. And then in the second step, we get um, oxidation with retention of configuration.
So let's draw the product after oxidation. So remember, when we oxidize, it's retention of configuration, so the hydroxyl goes exactly where the boron is. We don't flip anything. We don't switch anything. There's an OH here plus an antimer. The other possible um, product that we could get would be anti-addition, and we really we get here we get 98 percent. Sin addition, sin plus anti Markonikov addition. So these are these are very good reactions, very reliable, regioselective and stereoselective. And it's anti addition of water. So this complements our hydration method that we talked about earlier in the chapter that gives you Markonikov additions. Sometimes we want Markonikov, sometimes we want anti-Markonikov. Um, just remember that when you do the Markonikov addition and you're making a carbocation that you're going to get racemization, you're also going to get rearrangements. So um, that's shown on the next page. So we have the same we have the same alkene and we're just it's going to do hydroboration on the right or, or hydration on the left. So let's draw the hydroboration product. Anti-Markonikov. No rearrangements. No rearrangements because we're not forming any carbocations here, so we don't have to worry about rearrangements. What happens if we do hydration? Well, we're going to go through a carbocation intermediate. We will make a secondary carbocation as our intermediate. We know that we need to watch out for secondary carbocations because they can rearrange, and if they can rearrange, they will. And so what you end up getting is a 1,2 alkyl shift here, or a 1,2 hydride shift, not an alkyl shift. You get that. I skipped a little step here, so let's do two arrows. I skipped a step because you know, certainly water is going to attack and then we're going to deprotonate. Um, but see the difference in the product that you get. We've gotten actually a rearranged product here. Don't have to worry about rearrangement with hydroboration. Just, so just something to think about. So this one here is um, Markonikov addition, and I, I'm going to abbreviate that. Carbocation intermediate. Therefore, rearrangements are possible. All right, questions on hydration or hydroboration? Anybody? So now we're ready to move on to talk, start talking about synthesis. Okay, so synthesis is probably the most difficult part of this class. It's thinking in a way that you haven't really had a whole lot of practice thinking. So it's, the first step really is predicting products. So if you go to the, ch when you learn new reactions, you go to the end of the chapter, and the first parts are problems, here, predict the products. Some people never make it past those problems. You always want to make it to the part where you have synthesis. It's usually titled synthesis, and what it does is it has mixed up reactions from the chapter and it has mixed up reactions from previous chapters. So if you only have time to do, if you only have time to do sapling 
And some end of the chapter problems jump right to the synthesis problems from here on out. Those are going to be the most important preparation for the exam. Okay? And it's really important that you give it some thought before you look at the answer. Because what some people do is they go to the end of the chapter, they go to the synthesis, they look at the problem and they say, I don't know how to solve that. They look at the answer and say, oh, I get it. Now I know how to do it. Not on the test, you won't because you've never done it before. It's like, I'm, I'm going to teach you how to play tennis and you're going to just watch videos. I'm going to tell you about the form. I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to demonstrate the form. And now you go play tennis and you do well. You're not going to be able to do it. Okay, so that's the same idea. So I know, that, I know that answers for sapling are out there. I know that your answers for all the problems in your book are out there. But if you, if you rely the, on those too heavily, you're not going to do well in this class promise and guarantee you that. Okay, so just something to think about. So here's an example here. So predicting the products first, now we fill in reagents. We come up, we, we, we have this compound and we have to make this compound on, 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 the, um, on the right here. So we have this alcohol and we want to make a 1,2 dibromo. So have we talked about ways to make a 1,2 dibromo compound? We did in this chapter, right? Using bromine. So well, what we're going to use is um, something that's very helpful. It's called retrosynthesis. And this is a retrosynthetic arrow. And it means can be made from. So we have a lot of different arrows in this class. This is a can be made from. And it is a retrosynthetic arrow. I never make you do retrosynthesis, but it's just a tool for you to have. Sometimes when you look at a problem like this, you're going to be able to see the answer right away and you don't have to work backwards from the product. Um, but if you don't see something right away, it's a tool for you. You work backwards from the product and you look for common functional groups and their orientation in the molecule and think about if you know a ways, ways to make that. So definitely we talked about a way to make a trans 1,2 dibromo compound in this chapter and how we would make that is from an alkene. If we have the alkene and bromine, we can make that. That's all we need. All right, and then we always keep back, now we go back and we keep looking at our starting material. Every time we take this apart, we go back and look. Do we have a way to go from here to here? Dehydration, right? Okay, we could do a dehydration. We could go from here to here. And so uh, that's just a way to do this. It's just, it's a, it's a way, it's not the only way. But if we have our alcohol, so we keep, we want to keep going back to the alcohol. We want to, we want to eventually start with that compound. H2SO4 concentrated would what we use to favor um, dehydration, right? And heat. All right, so that's the retrosynthesis. On the, on the midterms and on the final, I grade the synthesis in the forward direction because it's really difficult to grade somebody's thought process if you're looking in the margins and trying to see what they're doing. It's very difficult to grade. So I grade in the forward direction, but this is just a tool for you. So let's write out the synthesis here in the forward direction. We start with our alcohol. So I have two types of synthesis problems. Uh, one like I'm just going to show you right now where we have open-ended. And you show me the products from every step. Okay, that's one type. H2SO4 concentrated. And we want heat to favor elimination. And we use concentrated sulfuric acid to favor elimination. And then we add bromine. Now, all of the reactions where we've used bromine addition to alkenes, they've had a solvent. If the solvent is not critical, you don't have to show it for my, for my class. So for me, just writing BR2 is enough. That's enough for me to know that you know what you're, what you're doing. If you were making a bromohydrin, then water becomes part of the product. You've got to show the water. But if it's not, if it's just an inert solvent, then you don't need to show it. 
So this is what I would call an open-ended synthesis. And I do have some of these. If you don't see one of these on midterm two, you will see one on the final. Or <coughs> might look like this. I also, have the, um, I also have some where I just have the reagent, the reactant here. And then I have a box with an arrow in it. And you fill in the reagents. So in the, in the instructions on, the, on this first midterm where everybody got confused, it was for this type of problem. And I said for reagents, if more than one step is required, number individual steps. That's what I was talking about, this type of problem. And when I first wrote the midterm, it, I had one of these in there, and then I took it out and I forgot to take that wording out. So my, test was, oh, my tests always turn out too long and then I have to take problems out. So um, I do time myself um, to make sure that I'm not giving you a test that's too long. So then if it's this type, you write um, H2SO4 concentrated, and heat, and then net step two, Br2. A, a lot of you leave the numbers out. And the numbers, if you leave the numbers out, you're either going to miss all the points or some of the points. It's you, it depends on how bad of a mistake it is. So usually you miss all the points. So the numbers are critical, critical. So let's label that so you, when you come back and look at this. Number each step. If more than one step is requirement, required, I want you to number each step. Okay, so where you get yourself into trouble on a problem like this, this is where you get yourself into trouble. You look at this problem on the test and you, start, and you panic. You're like, okay, I know how to take this hydroxyl and I know how to convert it into a bromine. PBR3 pyridine, and then you're like, oh crap, how am I going to get this other bromine on here? Okay, that's where you get into trouble. So what you want to start training your brain to look at these groups and say, oh, um, a 1,2 dibromo where the bromines are trans, I know how to make that. You're thinking backwards from the product, I know how to make that. Okay, so this, this next one on the next page is very similar. <laughs> more likely to throw you off. The reason it's more likely to throw you off is because you see, oh, I've already got the hydroxyl on there. All I need to do is put a bromine on there. And I would say probably 60% of you would write PBR3 pyridine. And you would get zero credit. Why? Does, it's not going to work. It, it doesn't put a bromine, it doesn't replace a, a hydrogen with a bromine. It's, we don't know a way to replace a hydrogen with a bromine here. So we don't know a way to do that. So we want to look here and we want to say, oh, I recognize that functional group. I've got a hydroxyl right next to a bromine and they're trans to each other. That's a bromohydrin. I know how to make a bromohydrin. Okay, so that's what that is. And you want to get used to looking for those. This is a bromohydrin. So a uh, retrosynthetically, I can make a bromohydrin from, so again, this is the can be made from arrow. Can be made from. All I need is the alkene. And I need bromine. Instead of with an inert solvent, I would use bromine and water. And that's going to give me a bromohydrin. And then each time I take this apart, I'm going back to my starting material and I'm saying, oh, can I make that yet? Yes, you can with a dehydration. So this is really no harder than the last one. So the synthesis is almost the same. As a previous synthesis. So we're just, we're, just, we're just taking it apart retrosynthetically. So let's write out the synthesis in the forward direction. 
And again, it might be open-ended where I, do I tell you I want, the reactant, I want the products from every single reaction that you do. Each step you get a product, or it might just be one of the ones where you fill in, in, in the box. So we start with our alcohol again. So again, retrosynthetically, we make this from the alcohol and we do a dehydration. So H2SO4 concentrated. All right, so now going in the forward direction, we start with our alcohol, H2SO4 concentrated. Those are the conditions for dehydration and heat. We make the alkene. And then we do bromine and water. So anti-addition. So you're going to get that plus it's an enantiomer. Questions so far on these synthesis problems? So there's 10. The last 10 problems in Chapter 10 are all synthesis problems. Some of them are more than um, two steps. These are two steps, but some of them are more. One of them is five steps. One of them is four. So we're making the leap from two steps to more than two steps. Let's do one more. All right, so this is another one that's going to throw you off. You see an alcohol, and if you're only looking in the forward direction, you're going to think, okay, I need to make an epoxide, so I'm just going to deprotonate this, and then I'm just going to, you know, uh, backside attack, kick off a hydride, right? Is that going to work? Okay, so some people will just write NaH and heat. That's not going to work. We, we can't kick off a hydride as a leaving group. So that's where the tool of retrosynthetic um, analysis is going to help you. I do know that I can make uh, an epoxide from a bromohydrin. Might not have remembered that. That might be off your radar. We learned how to make bromohydrins in this chapter, but when we were in chapter 9, we saw how to make an epoxide, right? We're going to learn a different way in chapter 12 that you'll like better, but this is the only way we know so far. Um, I can make that if I have a bromohydrin, and I just showed how to do that in the previous one. If I have a bromohydrin, then I, if I use NaH, then I can deprotonate. It's going to do backside attack, kick off the bromide, right? You remember that reaction? Okay, so you want to go look for that in chapter 9. Okay, so then I, I know to, to make the bromohydrin, um, I just did that in the last problem. I can make that from this and bromine and water. And then I certainly can make that from my starting alcohol. So we just added an additional step here. So it's a lot harder. Starting alcohol, H2SO4 concentrated, and heat. Those, that's what's going to favor elimination. So let's write out the synthesis in the forward direction. Start with my alcohol. Dehydration, H2SO4, concentrated, and heat. We get our alkene. Then what? Bromine water, Br2, H2O. So if you can recognize these, the placement of these functional groups in this molecule, um, it's going to help you. Um, it's going to help you immensely with synthesis. And then you just do NaH, and you've got your product. And you can just draw an arrow all the way to that product. That's what we're going to get after the sodium hydride step. Questions, anybody? So let me just give you a little, a little input on the last 10 chapters, uh, the last 10 problems in chapter 10 in sapling. There are two types. Okay, you, ha you start with an alcohol, you do a dehydration to get an alkene, and then you do a chapter 10 reaction. 
That's that. That's what we just did. Uh, what if you or um, what if you start with an alkyl halide? Then would you do a dehydration? No, you do an elimination. So those are the problems. You start with an, an if you start with an alcohol, you de do a dehydration to make an alkene, and then you do a chapter 10 reaction. If you start with an alkyl halide, you do an elimination, and then you do a chapter 10 problem. That's the that's exactly what it is, and you will definitely see those. On um, midterm two, you will definitely see those on the final. All right, that's chapter 10. Any questions on chapter 10? Okay, we're going to save that. That'll take a second. And I'm going to go down here. I want to show you something here. You guys like Google Chrome better, so that's what I'll use. All right, so under practice, there should be um, sample flashcards. We want to start cataloging our reactions. Oh, they're not here. Oh, dang it, all of that. I'm going to show you on Monday. Okay, so we want to start cataloging reactions. So you want to start writing. So like, okay, I, I have an alcohol, so you'd have an alcohol going to an alkyl halide and then underneath it ways to do that. So you get used to the transformations, seeing the transformations. Not, not the reactant plus the reagents and predicting the product, but just the overall transformation. So that's what you want to do. I will add those this weekend and you can take a look at some sample ones here and um, we'll be good to go. All right. We're going to start chapter 11. How about that? Very short chapter and easy chapter. If you know chapter 10, 11 is a breeze. If you don't know chapter 10, when you know chapter 10, 11 will be a breeze, okay? Honestly, it's not a hard chapter. All right, so let's talk about all kinds. What do we know so far? What do we do? Oh, we gotta go back and do our tools here. What are the bond angles for an alkyne? 180, right? 180 degrees, linear. This particular alkyne has a name, a common name that's very, very common that you need to know. It's going to throw you off. The name's going to throw you off. But the common name for this one, and I need you to know this because I might talk about it on a test and ask you to use it, is acetylene. And so that throws you off because you see the ene ending and you think, oh, it's an alkene. It's not. It's acetylene. It's the simplest alkyne. Don't know why they named it that, but you've heard of acetylene torches. We're not going to come and change the name now. It's an accepted name. For people who don't know chemistry, that's not going to throw them off at all. So um, let's talk a little bit about the structure. I'm going to draw, um, I'm going to draw the, all of the orbitals that overlap to make acetylene. So we know that carbon is sp hybridized, so here's an sp orbital. And then to make the carbon-carbon bond, I have an sp orbital here also. And then I have another sp orbital. So we know sp orbitals, linear relationship. So here's the other sp on this carbon. And then to make acetylene, we're overlapping with an s for hydrogen, right? That's an s orbital. And there's an S orbital, and that's the uh, that's hydrogen. So hydrogen S orbital. So to make the sigma bond here, it's um, overlap of an SP on carbon and an S on hydrogen. And to make this sigma bond right here in the middle, in the middle of the sigma bond is uh, we have a sigma bond overlap of an SP on carbon and an overlap of an SP on carbon. And then the, the uh, sigma bond on the right is exactly the same as the one on the left. Then we have two pi bonds, right? So let's change colors here. So on the sigma bonds I've drawn in the x-axis, let's do the y-axis for uh, one of the pi bonds. This would be the y-axis.
they're really far away from each other. Um, in real life, these would be close enough to overlap. But it, it, it gets a little tricky drawing these when they're so close that they overlap. So we're going to have overlap on the top and overlap on the bottom, and that is the pi bond. That's one pi bond. And then um, we have here, this one's the hardest one to draw. It's in the z-axis, right? So it's going to kind of be right here. It would be, re in real life, it would be heading down into your page and heading up above your page. It's just a little hard to draw. So that's a p orbital to make the second pi bond. Two pi bonds, one sigma bond for that carbon-carbon triple bond. And so it turns out, as we learned from when we did um, stereo, when, and when, we, when we did spectroscopy, we learned that for a carbon-carbon triple bond, we don't have just overlap with these p orbitals to make that pi bond and then overlap there. We actually have overlap all the way around. So this is the way the electrons circulate. So those p orbitals are all so fat that they all they all overlap. And we saw consequences of that in NMR, right? Remember that? So uh, let me draw what this looks like. I'm going to draw the carbon carbon. Sigma bond occupies this area right here. And then we have hydrogen here. So that's the sigma bond for that carbon hydrogen bond. This is the area where we have overlap for the sigma bond and this carbon hydrogen bond. And the, and, and the p orbitals are overlapping all the way around. So let me draw that in red. It's kind of like a tube. It's a little hard to draw here. Sometimes I do well, sometimes I don't. We'll just see what we got going on here. Like that. Right? How's that looking? So we're, we're, what we're talking about is overlap all the way around like this. It's going like this. So if this, if your arm, if my arm is the axis right here, it's, it's, it's wrapping around like this. That's the way the electrons are flowing. So it really has, it doesn't have a direction here. So we have um, two pi bonds. cylinder of pi density, of pi electron density. And so if you remember back to last quarter, this hydrogen on a terminal alkyne was in the shielding cone, remember that? So that, that was one of the consequences of that. So that's what the structure looks like. That's where our electron density is completely surrounding that sigma bond. Um, some terminology here, we have a terminal alkyne. That means that we have the alkyne on the end. So something like this. That would be a terminal alkyne. In internal alkyne, it's not on the end. It's in the middle somewhere. It's as simple as that. So that's an internal alkyne, this is a terminal alkyne. And uh, something else you may remember from last quarter, or maybe not, is that the uh, hydrogen on a terminal alkyne is acidic. This proton is acidic. Not super acidic, but acidic enough that we can remove it and make new carbon-carbon um, bonds. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. <laughs> Very briefly, nomenclature. So I may have an alkyne for you to name on the test. So we're going to name them very similar to alkenes. Hopefully people have already seen the alkene podcast, and this will make more sense. Simple alkynes are made much like alkenes, except the ending is changed from ain to ein, Y-N-E. Never the chain closest from the end closest to the triple bond substituents are named as they are in alkenes. I don't go crazy with naming. I would have something simple like this. All right, so we want the longest continuous chain that contains the alkyne. We're going to number the direction to give the alkyne the lowest number. One, two, three, 
four, five, six. So what are our substituents? Our substituents are three bromo, five methyl. So we have a three bromo. I'm just going to catalog everything here, what we have. Three bromo, five methyl. You also need to give a number for where the alkyne starts, and the alkyne starts at carbon one and ends at carbon two. So it is six carbons, it is one hexine. So instead of ane, it's six carbons, it would be hexane. We drop the ane and we do ine instead. And then we alphabetize this. Um, the bromo comes first, three bromo, five methyl, one hexine. So if you go to the, the, the problems in the back of the chapter and you see um, there's usually like a couple, of like three or four nomenclature questions and they give you 20 different things in each question, you don't have to do all of that. If you, know, if you get three right in a row, then you now can move on to more important things, which is more important things being reactivity. Yes? H before M. Uh, no, this is, the, this is the parent. That's the parent, so that always goes on the end. Good question. More questions? Okay. Priority. And here we get into priority. And I'm not going to worry, I'm, I am not going to make a big deal about priority. But if you have, let's say you have a, a, a compound and it has a hydroxyl and an alkene and an alkyne, how do we know which is going to be the parent? Uh, the OH takes priority over alkene, which takes priority over alkyne. Am I going to test you on that? No. That's not very important for you to know, but there is a priority. And so, for example, OH gets the numbering priority. The parent here is still um, the alkyne. Well, it's also the alcohol too, right? So um, the hydroxyl gets the numbering priority. All right, so this would be something harder than I would ask you on the test, but just in case you see it, let's number this. If we number in the direction of the alkyne getting the lowest number, it would be wrong. The alcohol gets the lower number, so this would be one, two, three, four, five. So this would be two methyl. <laughs> Three pentine, two all. Three, two methyl, three pentine, two all. So the three tells you that the al that the um, alkyne starts at carbon number three, and the number and the two all means that the alcohol is in the two position. Notice I dropped the e here for pentine. That's harder than I would give you. But that kind of just basically covers everything as far as that's concerned. All right, so there's one group on containing a carbon-carbon triple bond that's used in common nomenclature, and that's the propargyl group. And it just has such a nice sound to it, right? This is um, propargyl alcohol. And you say that in front of your friends that aren't in chemistry, oh, that's a propargyl alcohol. They're like, wow, you really know what you're talking about. Okay, so this is similar to which, which type? It's similar to allyl, except in allyl you have a CH2 bonded to an alkene. Here you have a CH2 bonded to an alkyne. So it's very similar. Um, this would be the um, propargyl carbon. And these hydrogens would be propargyl hydrogens. So really um, very much like allyl. We have allylic carbons, propar these are propargyl carbons. We have allylic uh, hydrogens, and these would be propargyl hydrogens. All right, very exciting. Let's go back to acidity. This is chapter two. This is completely 100% review for you. Doesn't that make you happy? 
one alkynes. Terminal alkynes are significantly more acidic than the corresponding alkene or alkane, and we talked about why. I don't expect you to remember that, so I'm going to remind you. We're talking about acidity of these three hydrogens. Why is acetylene so much more acidic than ethane? Well, it's 25 here for the pKa. This one is 44. We're not talking real acidic here, but way more. This is, a, a, an alkyne is not 25 times more acidic than an alka alkane. It is 10 to the 25th times more acidic. Remember, this is a log. So it's 10 to the 25th times more acidic. So why is it so much more acidic? If you don't remember why, we've got to look at the con conjugate base. We've got one more minute, and then I'm going I'm to set you loose. Look at the conjugate bases, lone pair in an sp orbital, right? Remember hybridization effects? Here we have a lone pair in, in an sp2 orbital. And then we have here, we have a lone pair in an sp3 orbital. So if you have a lone pair in an sp, uh, sp orbital, the, the um, electrons are closer to the nucleus. And I, I promise to stop right at 12.50, so I will finish this thought on Monday. I hope you guys have a great weekend.